CVE 2019-14899. New vulnerability lets attackers sniff or hijack VPN connections, and there's plenty of other news stories on it, that it is a really interesting vulnerability. And there's lots of headlines, but instead of going through all the headlines and that, you know, news cycles want to get the clicks and they want to tell you the sky is falling to get you to read, I'm at least going to start with the sky is not falling. Uh, VPNs are still safe, but there are some attacks now that are interesting and I'm going to dive into that. And there's ways to mitigate it. So how does this work? Well, first, this is an attack against VPN clients running on Unix-based systems. And we mean like Linux and Mac and uh, BSD and potentially some Android flaws are related to this as well uh, because once again it's kind of loosely based on Linux on the back end. This does not affect a Windows side system. Now this is all client side attacks by the way. Is, uh, this is not something you have to change out your routing for. You don't have to change out your VPN server side. This is a client side attack. And this is really an interesting because uh, I didn't really think this was possible. And of course, that's uh, what these security researchers do. They take something that might be plausible, might be interesting and dive into it and attack it and figure out some of these edge cases. And we're going to talk about everything that needs to be done to make this attack work and to show one, it's not easy. It's not like one push. Even if you automated this, it still takes a lot of noise on a network to get it going. So we're going to walk through the whole attack and the methodologies and then we'll talk, to, uh, talk about the mitigation. We'll also talk about how this happened and what changes were made in systems to cause this. This vulnerability works against OpenVPN, WireGuard, uh, Ike v2, and IPsec. So this does work against um, multiple VPN platforms. We're going to talk specifically about OpenVPN, but it does work against the other ones. I just happen to have OpenVPN set up, so when we walk through the scenarios, we'll talk about that. There are three steps to this attack. Determine the VPN client's virtual IP address. So when you attach with a VPN, it's going to hand you a virtual IP address in addition to your local network IP address. Using the virtual IP address to make an inner inference about active connections. This is where things get tricky, but they are they found a way to, and this is a key piece of it, to infer what websites you're going to. And they have to know what websites you're going to and then determine the packets, so using encrypted replies to unsolicited packets to determine the sequence and acknowledgement numbers of the active connections to hijack the TCP session. So the goal is TCP has a series of packets, uh, SYN, ACK, that go back and forth, and they have their timed and numbered, so they go in order. They have to determine that number, determine that order, and then spoof and insert things within those packets that are going over the VPN, which normally the VPN is tunneling and encrypting these. So they have to use the, and the inference is an important component of this to make it work. The victim device connected to AP, this is their tallest scenario of this. And actually, instead of reading this, I put one together uh, to show you what it would look like. Basically, the attacker has to be here. They have to be part of the infrastructure. So this is public Wi-Fi controlled by the actor. You could also replace this with a public switch. Like if not really that there's many public switches that you go to a place and plug it in, but let's say a bad actor has control of the infrastructure and the routing of it. So you have to pass through their equipment that has all the capabilities and tooling on it to be able to pull this attack off. That is a, a first key part of it. Most likely is obviously a public Wi-Fi because when you're on public Wi-Fi, a VPN will encapsulate your traffic to get it out past this device, and that should be adequate to protect you. And prior to this, we always assume, generally speaking, that yes, this is uh, how that's mitigated. This does not work the same as random user that can also see your IP address. So let's say I'm in public Wi-Fi at a public place and other random user on same network. There are methods by which they can attack, referred to as like ARP spoofing, and this is, has a similar attack vector to that. So they take the ARP spoofing and they would try to get you to go to their computer. This is not that type of attack because the importance of this attack is the local IP, which is known by the public infrastructure uh, that you're connecting to, the public Wi-Fi, I should say, that's controlled by the bad actor, they have to then determine what your VPN virtual IP address is. Now, that is not an arbitrarily easy task. That's actually the first part of the attack. They don't see it. So when you have your local IP and you go through the VPN process and I put my router VPN device, whatever that might be, or a service you're connecting to, if it's a VPN service, like one of the you know public ones that offer this type of service, 
you go out to the internet and all of your traffic is tunneled. But when you establish this connection over here, this device hands you this IP address. That's all done through tunneled and encrypted traffic. So they don't just get that information no matter how close they watch it because, well, it's tunneled and encrypted. And I have a whole video about uh, TLS encryption and OpenVPN I can link to where I've do dove into some of how that works. The way they determine this is rather clever, and this is how the attack vector is. Scroll down here. So what they're doing is sending a bunch of uh, RST to there. So they're sending uh, resets to your network and hoping to find your IP address for the virtual because this is the flaw. The system starts acknowledging that the fact that you have a virtual IP address. So they go and are pumping information towards your IP and seeing if they get certain information back from it. That's what's a little confusing as to how they're doing it. And they don't have the full proof of concept out yet, but it's interesting because uh, it was assigned to CVE. It's under review. They're waiting for mitigations. So with OpenVPN, it's, uh, you know, a lot of them are set up 192.168.70. whatever uh, that range. So they can just poke through ranges. Uh, so that is one of the first challenges. But once they determine that, they can start spoofing it. And what allows them to do that was what puzzled me. And I had to dive deeper into the reading to understand what allowed them to do this. Why does the system start responding? It was an interesting answer. So it starts here of right here. Most Linux distributions we tested were vulnerable, especially Linux distributions that use a version of system D pulled after November 28th of last year. So this is 2019, December, and this was in 2018 in November that they changed this. So let's go all the way over and because, well, this is the beauty of open source. It's open and you don't just arbitrarily make willy-nilly changes in code. You have reasons you made them. This is the switch change. It's called the RP filter with switch from one to two and the use case for it. It's not because some uh, NSA bad actor got into the open source code and monkeyed with this. This is what people always like to think happens. Um, but this is the very simple reason that this occurred. The switch is the RFC 3704 reverse path filtering from strict mode to loose mode. The strict mode breaks some pretty common reasonable use cases, such as keeping connections via default route alive after another one appears, i.e. plugging in uh, the Ethernet cable while connected to Wi-Fi. The strict filter also makes it impossible for an network manager to do connectivity check on a new arriving default route. It starts with a higher metric and is bumped lower if there's connectivity. The kernel's default zero, no filter, but a loose filter is good enough. A few use cases where a strict filter mode uh, may easily override this. This just the distribution don't care that the client's use case prefer a strict filter could just ship a custom configuration. What this means is this is a change at system D level to, to establish a default. And so uh, distribution such as Ubuntu that use system D or Pop OS like I'm using. When they pull it, this is default, but of course, any distribution can override this. That's why we don't have the absolute clearest picture yet. We have to look on a case by case in case any specific distribution uh, did override this setting. But why, you know, the use case for it is really simple. Let's go back over here. I'm plugged into the Wi-Fi here and uh, hooked up, but I have my VPN established. What if I want to change or I plug in another uh, like a hard line, a network cable? Well, you don't want the VPN to drop. You want to be able to Keep that VPN going even when that changes. That's the flaw that's actually allowing this in. So here's my computer and here's my IP address and here's my tunneled IP address, that extra one on there that you normally would not expect to accept anything other than stuff that goes through the encapsulated tunnel. So it's kind of interesting the fact that they found a way to get the system to eventually respond with enough basically spoofing information and then they can start uh, going through and getting it to accept that spoofed information, provided they get the right sequence and match it up and uh, make more noise, essentially, is what my understanding is, than the standard stream so they can get something in there. And obviously, they could, uh, if you're in control of the infrastructure, you may want to, at the same time that you know the packets are coming back, insert your packets and then somehow hold up the packets that would be coming there. So it's kind of playing out some of these scenarios. Um, but like I said, this is not some easy arbitrary attack. And then they were able to insert that traffic. What about how... What is it they're going to actually accomplish with it? Well, here's the thing. I wrote over here, unencrypted site. That's an important aspect of it. So you say we've tunneled all of our traffic through the controlled system so they can't see it. They threw the internet over to a VPN device. Uh, maybe it's something on my network. And then I go out of this device. So I'm encapsulating all my traffic. But they infer what website I'm going to. And they know what unencrypted website I'm going to. 
what does that mean? Well, now they can look at that traffic and they can start inserting return information that's invalid or different than I would expect in an attempt to attack me. But unencrypted is an important part. If you're doing all this, and then on top of that, the site you're going to is an encrypted site. Well, now they have a problem. They would have to break the encryption of that site. And that is not arbitrary uh, thing to do, especially if sites are using the latest TLS 1.3. That's a really solid uh, level of encryption. It's technically double encrypted, triple if you count the VPN here. Therefore, that's where this attack stops. But don't get me wrong, it's still serious. I'm not saying that this isn't a potential threat. I'm just saying the attack is not as likely uh, unless you're also going to an unencrypted site. But if you're going to an unencrypted site and doing something um, confidential, that's in bad in general uh, because every hop in between an internet is not just one globe like I show here. It's a lot of pieces in between. Any of your traffic can be seen in between one an unencrypted site. That's just a general problem. So that's one of the reasons we've had such a big push for encrypting all the sites over the last several years. And now here in 2019, well, end of 2019, pretty much every major website's encrypted and even some of the other ones because, well, with companies like Let's Encrypt and the Acme protocol, we've just gone to everything default encrypted. So this protects against a lot of this attack uh, because someone has to spoof it. But DNS, I've done a couple of videos on DNS and DNS over HTTPS. That's where there's still an issue because if you're still not using... Um, the why you're not encrypting all your DNS traffic, you're using just standard plain old port 53 DNS. Well, they might have the potential to go, hey, look, they're using a DNS server. We can see this traffic. We can infer that this is there. And we're going to insert different DNS entries to send you to the wrong places. So there's still a big risk there. But if you're using encrypted DNS, especially if you're using encrypted DNS between your device and uh, your VPN device, or you're using DOH for the browsing, well, there you go. If you're using uh, DNS over HTTPS, DOH, you're good because now they can't encrypt, they can't spoof the DNS, they can't spoof site because it's encrypted. They have been thwarted, provided they had all the means by which to do this attack, which is fairly complicated to begin with. So it's a lot to think about, but it's still not the end of the world, but it's still something that needs to be patched. So I never try to downplay any seriousness of security issues, but I like to make sure it's clear that this is not the end of the world and there's some mitigations against it. The mitigations have not been released, but if you go over here and we dive down, they have a listing of how to mitigate that. And we have here, uh, turning off the path filtering being the obvious one. Potential problem, asynchronous routing, not reliable on mobile devices. This is that problem of why they turned it on in the first place. Um, and they do say there still might be possibilities to get that attacked. Bogon filtering, there's another option where you don't allow uh, the VPN to listen to Bogon networks, you know, private space networks. Uh, that would be a way to do it, but then they had comment, comment that network address used for VPNs and local networks and some nations, including Iran, include used reserved IP address space for uh, the public space. There's another one. Encrypted packet size and timing. And there's a reply on that one uh, that you can actually use in IPsec. It's off by default, but traffic flow control confidentiality. And basically, you're creating um, a padding in there so they can't do the inference of what the website is, making the attack kind of go away. Um, also, it's noted in here in this reply that Tor is not affected because of the way the Tor destination address binds to uh, localhost. So I thought that was interesting that it was observed in that um, that regard to that. But I'll leave links to this so you can do the reading. I just wanted to say, one, it's a very serious thing. I'll agree with that. But also, it's not the end of the world. I think it's something we'll work through. It's something we'll get patched. And it's not a server-side problem. It's not something you replace your server for to make this work. It's something on the client side, so there'll be an update and a patch release for this, and it should work perfectly fine after they fix it. Um, they just have to make a determination. And like I said, I don't have an exhaustive list of every operating system. They have a couple of lists in here, but obviously we know the major ones are affected because they've been pulling this, but it sounds like Ubuntu operating system. They confirmed this on Ubuntu 19.10, so I'm going to assume Pop OS 1910 as well. Uh, Fedora pulling system D, Debian 10.2, Arch, and Manjuro. Uh, so there's our ones they've tested. Uh, FreeBSD, DeepIn, Slackware, Void Linux, MX Linux. Uh, so there's a couple of them. And like they said, there's not an exhaustive list. Don't assume because you're not on a list. You don't have the problem. It's a matter of whether or not the operating system you're using pulled that information over here uh, from the system D and had those changed from then and didn't change the default from what they pulled. 
So hopefully this clears that up a little. Uh, it's like I said, it's a Linux slash Unix problem, not a Windows problem to my knowledge. Um, as of right now, we don't know of this being a problem uh, with OpenVPN and Linux. But hey, you, you know, the once we've uh, uncovered a piece of research, and I am surprised myself that the VPN would, the virtual IP from the tunneled VPN would even accept a other type of command going to it or other uh, TCP packets. I'm absolutely certain more security researchers are going to be attempting this on other platforms so these these flaws still may exist elsewhere that we just haven't found out about yet uh but hey look for patches and uh look for more security researchers and updates but don't don't worry you're generally speaking uh the whole proof of concept's not out there and it doesn't that it doesn't appear that anything is in the wild that we know of right now uh stay safe and thanks and thank you for making it to the end of the video if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.